Hi, I'm artist Lillian Gray, and today I would like to share with you the art of Nicholas Globo. Nicholas Globo is one of South Africa's leading contemporary artists. Over the last decade, he has exhibited mixed media artworks and striking performance art worldwide. He uses a variety of materials to construct giant sculptures and installations. He is best known for using rubber, leather, and silk ribbons, all held together with his trademark stitching. His sculptures often reference large creatures or organs, but what do they mean? In these artworks, Nicholas explores his cultural identity and life as a Kosa man in South Africa. Come with me as we explore Nicholas's life and the Kosa culture. Just a quick reminder that you can buy various worksheets and activities on this artist on our Teachers Pay Teachers store. Did you love the famous movie The Black Panther? Wakanda might be a fictional place, but its language is very real. The on-screen spoken language of the Kingdom of Wakanda is Isi Kosa. It is the language of the Kosa tribe of South Africa. And artist Nicholas Klobo is part of this tribe. South Africa has 11 official languages. Kosa is one of the most recognizable ones, mainly due to the prominence of its click consonants. It is a complex language that employs three basic click sounds. To get an idea of how Kosa sounds, you can listen to Miriam Akeba's famous song, also known as the click song. Kosa culture has a particular hierarchy and structure. Each person within the Kosa culture has their place, which is recognized by the entire community. From birth, a Kosa person goes through graduation stages, which recognizes their growth and assigns them a place within their community. A specific ritual marks each stage to introduce the individual to their peers and ancestors. These rituals and ceremonies are sacred to the identity and heritage of the Kosa. They are performed to mark the transition from childhood to adulthood. All these rituals are symbolic of one's development. A high value is placed on masculinity in the Kosa tribe. Kosa men traditionally filled the roles of hunters and warriors. Therefore, animal skins form an important part of their traditional wear. One traditional ritual still regularly practiced is the manhood ritual, a secret rite that marks the transition from boyhood to manhood. Boys are painted with white clay, each given a blanket, and sent off to the mountain for several weeks. During the process, they observe numerous customs. Girls are also initiated into womanhood. They too are secluded, though for a much shorter time. Respect between younger members of the tribe and the elders is vital. Young boys are deliberately not given much respect at all. In an interview with Kaleidoscope magazine, Nicholas explained that Kosa boys are basically treated like a dog. The treatment is deliberate to instill fear and respect but most of all, to create a desire to achieve. They must work at becoming a man and to be respected in society. Perhaps one of the most interesting members of this intensely traditional society is the seer, the witch doctor, more colloquially known as the Sangoma. They act as fortune tellers and healers and are effectively the living channel between the people and their ancestors. This task generally falls to the women. The Kosas are intensely religious, with their ancestors acting as a link to their god. Dreams, rituals, initiations, and feasts are an essential part of their worship. And even though many have embraced Christianity, they have not forsaken their traditional belief systems. Instead, they tend to fuse the two into what is now known as the family of African independent religions. Some famous Kosa people include the great Nelson Mandela, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who coined the phrase Rainbow Nation, former President Thabo Mbeki, assassinated Communist Party leader Chris Harney, Africa's Queen of Song, Miriam Makeba, and the actor John Carney are all Kosa. So now that you know more about Nicholas Hlobo's culture and tradition, let's look at his journey. To understand Hlobo's art, we must travel back in time and look at the zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a fancy word that simply means the spirit of the time. So we must ask, what happened while Nicholas Klobel was growing up? When it comes to Zeitgeist, the date is always our first clue. Nicholas Klobel was born in 1975 in South Africa. 
By investigating this period in history, you will soon realize that during this time, it was apartheid in South Africa. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word that means separateness. It was a system that separated people by race. This system was super unfair. It aimed to protect white South Africans' domination over non-whites in every aspect of life. Apartheid started in 1948 in South Africa and lasted for nearly 50 years. In 1987, South Africa had a lot of international pressure to change its ways and free Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for fighting against apartheid. Okay, so that is what was happening at the time in South Africa when little Nicholas was born. He had a rural upbringing in the Transkei in the Eastern Cape, where he lived with his grandmother. Nicholas's grandmother was strict and had a massive guiding influence on him. He calls her one tough cookie. She always taught him to be honest and seek life's truth. Nicholas grew up in a house without a male figure. His grandma often used to say she wears both the bra and the pants in the house. From a young age, Nicholas started identifying with both traditional male and female traits. With such a strong emphasis on masculinity in the Kosa culture, he often felt different and like an outsider. He soon realized he was born gay. Being a gay Kosa man has come with many challenges for Nicholas Global. Being gay is a massive no-no and taboo in his culture. Homosexuality is deeply offensive and unsettling to the Kosa tradition. Great emphasis is placed on the ritual surrounding manhood. Let's move along in our timeline. Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first democratically elected president in 1994. It was the official end of white minority rule. A new South Africa was born, a democratic country, with equal rights for all in terms of race, gender and religion. Everybody came together to celebrate the birth of a new nation, the Rainbow Nation, consisting of 11 different official languages and even more tribes and nationalities. People were united, some anxious, but mostly excited about this new Rainbow Nation. Groups who were suppressed during apartheid were free to flourish and encouraged to explore their different cultures. In 1995, just a year after the first democratic election in South Africa, Nicholas moved to Johannesburg. He moved from a monoculture to a multiculture. Living in the diverse Johannesburg, he soon realized that other tribes generally disliked the Gaza people. Some even despised them. They regarded them as cunning, a devious tribe that should not be trusted. And this made Klobuk question what it really meant to be Kosa. What did they stand for? What were their defining traits and rituals? He came to appreciate his culture deeply. He decided to make art that honored and preserved his culture and stories. Klobuk initially studied art to get a job in the film industry, but later decided to pursue a career as a visual artist. At first, he explored art making independently, but then enrolled at various institutions to actively start building his art career. Hlobo launched his career as a solo artist in 2006 with an exhibition at the Michael Stevenson's Gallery in Cape Town. This is where Nicholas's big break came with his sculptural object that included colonial chairs layered with melted sunlight soap. The chairs are the old bull and clow, meaning bull and lion paw chairs associated with a middle-class South Africa during the apartheid era. Sunlight soap is a product that was brought to South Africa originally by the colonialists. It is used for washing almost everything and anything, from hair, clothes and floors to dishes. Some Gogol's grandmas even washed your mouth clean from swearing. The soap has a distinctive smell and often conjures up childhood memories. This soap has become entrenched in various cultural rituals in the Kosa culture. Often bodies have to be cleansed with the sunlight soap as one of the steps in a particular ritual. Today, sunlight soap is no longer sold in Europe, but is still immensely popular in South Africa. In Klober's artwork, it is clear that the soap was melted and then sat on, imprinting the shape of a buttocks. This installation carries various meanings. This is an incredible striking object that gained much attention and success, launching Nicholas Klober's career as an artist. He won the Tolman Award for Visual Arts in 2006, then another residency followed in 2007 where he spent two months in New York, and during this year, Klober was also invited to show at the Artlop National Festival in Potschofstroom. In 2009, he won the prestigious Standard Bank Young Artist Award. 
In 2010, he was chosen as the Rolex apprenticeship winner to be mentored by Sir Anish Kapoor. All of these achievements have catapulted him onto the world stage. It has taken just a few short years for Globo to rise to fame. He has even exhibited at the Tate Modern in London. Now that you know a little bit more about Globo's background, let's look at the main themes in his artworks. Nicholas Globo combines various materials to create his sculptures and installations. He often combines ribbon, leather, wood, and found objects that he fuses with weaving and stitching. He creates both two- and three-dimensional art pieces using these materials. Each material relates to the Kosa culture and Nicholas's life. He ensures that every piece of his project has a meaning and connects to the narrative. He chooses materials that tell a story of his people, South Africa, and himself. The use of rubber in his artwork references township living and the pain of apartheid South Africa. You see, tires were often burnt during protests. They were also used in the infamous necklacing deaths. So the rubber references South Africa's past. However, the material is also associated with cars and represents masculinity. It could also refer to modernization. Leather, another reoccurring material in Global's practice, references cattle's economic, social, political, and spiritual significance in the Kosa culture. In Kosa culture, wealth is measured by cattle and the size of the chief's kraal. It's also often used as a currency to trade specific items. Cattle is often slaughtered as part of various rituals. In Globo's art, leather references the Kosa practices and values. Globo never lets a piece of material go to waste. He often uses a lot of everyday objects that are discarded and thrown away in the streets of Johannesburg, using the trash of South Africa to tell its stories. He recycles and rehashes materials, giving them new meanings and associations. The use of bones in his sculptures refers to the Sangoma in his culture. Sangomas uses bones, vertebrae, and other objects for bone-throwing rituals. In these rituals, the healer scatters the bones and other objects in front of the client. The healer then reads the groupings and positioning in which the object falls. Each item is personally chosen by the Sangoma, often because the healer feels led to the object. The bones and objects can be read to diagnose the client's illness or to discover what is missing from their life. In the case of bones, Sangoma carefully select them based on the animal they originate from. For example, a hyena bone is associated with a thief and may assist someone in finding a hidden or stolen object. A baboon bone falling towards a person is a sign of favor. However, pointing in another direction could indicate death. Carnival bones can predict the outcome of trials. Two female bones, both facing up, could indicate a conspiracy between women in the home. It's not just the objects that have meaning, but also how they fall. The indigenous healer must first identify the fall, interpret it, and then prescribe medication based on the interpretation. Once you understand all these references behind these mediums, you will soon realize Nicholas Klober's artwork depicts complex stories of what it means to be an international, modern, causa black, gay man in South Africa today. The contrast between the materials he selects for his artwork brings me to the next theme. Juxtapositioning is when you put two words or objects next to each other that are contrasting or opposite. You do this on purpose. For example, Nicholas places rubber next to satin ribbons. The material highlights each other's differences. Ribbons are soft and pretty and they are often used to decorate hair or gifts, unlike rubber which is hard and used in car tires. The ribbon represents femininity and the rubber masculinity. By juxtapositioning specific materials, Global plays with certain conflicting contrasts and ideas. He often refers to this and plays with the differences between ancestral worship and Christianity, strength and vulnerability, foreignness and familiarity, dominance versus submission, our mental being and our physical well-being, traditional art and crafts, versus high art, the masculine versus feminine, and the old versus the new. He takes all these materials, cuts them, pierces them, and pieces them together with his repetitious baseball stitch. He deliberately leaves the gashes, cuts, and stitching visible in his art. 
The unraveling, the stitching, the mending, the cutting up, weaving and knitting together are all metaphors for the process of trying to build a new culture. He says we are stitching pieces of history together to build something new and create a new South Africa. The stitching can be seen as the healing of South Africa's old wounds. Stitching, sewing and embroidery is traditionally a female craft. By combining it with a masculine rubber, he explores the gender expectations within his culture. Grobo creates various creatures inspired by Kosa folklore, songs and rituals. They are usually huge and monstrous. They loom overhead or fill the entire gallery floor. His creatures are hybrid, ambiguous beasts that are difficult to identify. Sometimes it could be an animal or maybe an organ. Their organic forms make them feel fleshy. Some have been displayed with red lights to enhance the viewer's feeling that they are inside a body. Often stitching and ribbons erupt from the figures, evoking blood or bodily fluids pouring out. Slaughter is part of Kosa culture. Rituals are often accompanied by slaughtering cattle. This act of violence, however, also announces a rebirth, a new beginning, or celebrates a specific milestone. In Kosa culture, you are meant to know your place within society. It's generally frowned upon to blow your own horn. As a young man, you are meant to blend in and not stand out to respect your elders and wait your turn. Nicholas often conflicts with the expectations of his tribe and his inner desires. He uses the trumpet as a metaphor to capture his feelings regarding this. Like most instruments, the trumpet can either stand alone or together. Nicholas creates trumpets that stand alone. The elongated forms are also almost creature-like. It reminds me of kelp washed up on the beach in the Western Cape. The kelp was once part of a mighty kelp forest. Now it's on its own and slightly out of place on the shore. Nicholas explains that he is often seen as too ambitious. He is a Kosa man, yet he has a deep desire to be a world-famous artist, to be seen, to be noticed, to be heard, and to share his stories and culture with the world. Over many years, there has been tension between arts and crafts. The boundaries between the two are sometimes blurred, especially regarding African art. There's a general feeling of looking down at crafts with an arrogant attitude which generates remarks such as, oh, that's cute. For many years in Europe, most African art was simply regarded as craft. It was not seen as high art. Even though famous European artists such as Picasso, Matisse and the German Expressionists drew inspiration from African art. Nicholas uses various craft techniques in his artworks blurring the boundary between art and craft. When asked about his stitching and embroidery, he says, it's a labor-intensive work. When you stitch, some people think it's craft, that it's not important. As previously explained, Kosa culture is filled with various rituals, marking rites of passage. It has specific ceremonies that accompany a transition from one stage to another, such as from adolescence to adulthood. Each culture has events or ceremonies which mark milestones or important points in a person's life. In Christianity, babies are baptized or they may be confirmed when children are a bit older. Girls and boys who follow Judaism celebrate their bar mitzvah when they are 13 years old. Samskara in Hinduism are sacraments that begins with one's birth that celebrate early steps in a baby's growth. In Western tradition, the 21st birthday is supposed to be the occasion upon which a young person becomes an adult. This was traditionally when a child was given a key to the front door of the home. In Afrikaans, the term mondig is given to young people when they turn 21. And this is when you are considered an adult and you can legally sign a contract. Global often references this in his work. He refers to himself, his own milestones and South Africa and the country's journey and rite of passage. Most of Global's artworks titles are Causa. It is a language rich in idioms, puns and layered meanings. His narrative titles reflect South African stories, some told to him as a child by his grandmother, as well as games and rhymes. Many titles are ambiguous and have deeper meanings. Nuances are lost on non-native speakers. He titles his work in Isi Kosa to firmly anchor it to the Kosa culture and does not dumb it down to make it easier for others to pronounce. Now that you understand some of the themes that appear in Nicholas Global's work, Let's look at three important artworks by this artist that you should know. The first artwork you should know is called Impundulu Zonke Ziyandi Landela. Translated, it means all the lightning birds are after me. 
It's an enormous sculpture created by Klobel out of various materials such as tires, ribbons, wood, and an animal skull. The artwork is a beast with large extended wings and a horned skull head attached to a body of discarded tires and inner tubes. This is a mythological creature from the Kosa culture. It is associated with witchcraft and darkness in both Kosa and Zulu cultures. It is a bird-like creature that can also transform into a beautiful young man. The beast refers to a Kosa song about this vampire creature. It is known to be a servant of a witch doctor, a Sangoma. Parents often use this story to scare young children into obedience. Grobo's impression of the mythical beast is as ominous as the song suggests. A fleshless skull forms the head of an enormous dragon-like bird. The black wings casts the exhibition hall into deep shadows and creates a sense of dread. Its hindquarters seems hurriedly attached, almost like a Frankenstein monster. The creature's skin is rubbery, looking sickly, and red ribbons drip from the bird, as it is usually drenched in blood. I am telling a South African story, explains Global. I am not the only one who has told the story. They're old stories, but through that I'm celebrating my identity as a South African. Looking at the sculpture, it's unclear whether this beast is male or female, and that is done intentionally. Global says, through my artworks, I attempt to create conversations that explore certain issues within my culture as a South African. The conversation becomes a way of questioning people's perceptions around the issues of masculinity, gender, race, and ethnicity. This artwork was proudly and prominently displayed at the world's most prestigious 54th Venice Biennale, representing South Africa on its own, completely independent from the South African pavilion. Chief curator Mark Utsia described the work as a Biennale highlight and wasted no time in securing its purchase. It has been displayed at the Zaitz Museum of Contemporary South African Art in Cape Town. The curator says that the social value of this artwork is undeniable. It has the potential to shift prejudices problematic to South Africa and global society. It celebrates South Africa's cultural heritage and preserves a story designed to be lost as oral traditions fade away. Our next artwork is called Ingobo Yesiswe. The title translates to Clothes or Blanket of the Nation. It is an artwork of hundreds of stitched pieces of leather and rubber sewn together to create a large animal form. It is a lunging, headless beast that could have been decapitated as part of a sacrifice for a ritual. Plastic, ribbons and organza spills out of the beast, depicting the ceremonial slaughter. The title of this work relates to a commemorative practice in Koza culture, whereby a cow's hide is used to cover a corpse before burial. This protects the individual as they pass into the afterlife. The top part of the sculpture is made out of leather, and the bottom is predominantly rubber. The top represents Koza practices, while the bottom rubber could also represent modernization. It is stitched so that the transition from the one to the other is not too apparent. The materials used in this artwork were collected from the streets of Doornfontein, Johannesburg. Here, Globo is stitching together pieces of leather in an attempt to heal. The combination of stitching these materials together is a metaphor for the healing of South Africa. He deliberately leaves the stitching visible. Globo suggests that the damage of apartheid cannot be concealed. Recovery and healing should be celebrated instead of disguised. And this leads me to our third and final artwork for this video. It is called... Global staged a performance where he wore a customized outfit referencing a Kosa song. It is commonly known as the Click Song and famously sung by Maria Makeba. It's about the Toktoki beetle, which in Kosa mythology symbolizes good luck and traveling or going on a journey. The title literally translates to Journey Doctor or the Road Doctor. It also refers explicitly to the dung beetle's journey being uphill. The hump suggests a burden that needs to be carried and is the historical baggage of South Africa. The idea is that an invisible backpack follows all South Africans. Globo explains, being South African means we all carry an invisible backpack around. Sometimes it's heavy and sometimes it's not. But whenever you mention you are from South Africa, people mention politics or apartheid. Dung beetles are beetles that collect feces and they are known as rollers. They gather them and roll them into a little ball. Their behavior inspired Nicholas Globo to create this artwork. Like a dung beetle, South Africa as a nation gathered feces and moved them around. 
South Africa has collected trauma over the years. However, like in all things in life, there is a careful balance between good and bad. The dung beetle also needs these feces to survive. You see, they lay their eggs inside the dung ball, and once the eggs hatches, the ball breaks open and a new generation of dung beetles is released. The journey of the dung beetle is a metaphor for South Africans in the post-apartheid era. Being South African and coming from a country that is often described as the third world, we have to show that we are proud of our country and create art that demonstrates this. The Kosa culture is not respected as much as it deserves. Referencing the Kosa culture is a way of telling a story, a South African human story that many have told before, in a way that is fresh. Nicholas Globo has also collaborated with some world-famous brands. One of these is Louis Vuitton. In 2019, Nicholas Globo was chosen as one of six artists to redesign some of their famous bags. The items are sought after by many and are high fashion items. When Globo was asked, have you created fashion with this bag or have you created art? He responded, I believe it's a bit of both. That's completely dependent on the person in possession of it. From my side, my interpretation of it is that this is art. The bag before the artwork is different. It's about purpose. But when it is in my possession, it is art. Each piece of this collection was available at a limited edition of 300 and retailed for $8,600 each. In summary, Nicholas Globo is considered one of South Africa's brightest art stars. His use and choice of materials are what makes his artworks so unique and fascinating. His work is a great example of the diverse cultures in South Africa. Through his art, he strives to bring awareness of the Kosa culture and keep it relevant. Klobo believes that the hardships and bitterness of the past will drive the people of South Africa towards a better future for all. And that's it for our video on the South African artist Nicholas Klobo. I would like to remind you that you can shop various worksheets and activities for all ages online on our Teachers Pay Teachers website regarding this artist. Connect with us on social media and let us know what video you would like to see next. I'm artist Lillian Gray and I love teaching art and art history. Remember to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when a new video is released. Until next time!